delay that uh, any more than is necessary. Without further ado, let me welcome and let us all welcome the profound elder, Dr. John Henry Clark. Always encouraging for me to be back with you again. I have just a little housekeeping chore, then I'll be on my way. Um, a lady asked me to uh, find a copy of my course called Dimensions of World History that I teach at Hunter College. And it was almost like my students inevitably when I go through the files to bring them something they ask me for, they don't show up the next time. <laughs> well, the, she never gave me a name, but I've, I've had it last week and I bought it this week, so if she, <laughs> that I've fulfilled my, my, my basic promise. Another thing is that um, because I've integrated so much of the material of some of the lectures into other lectures, I find that I have um, covered so much that, that it gives me time, and I needed it, to insert a special lecture next to the end. So tonight's lecture the Civil Rights Movement and the Dream Deferred. But the next lecture after the Thanksgiving holiday would really be a lecture on our search for history and our search for definition and how we as a people got lost for his, from history. Um, so, next week, I will really be talking about the black American search for his place in history. And when I talk about the black American search, I'm talking about the whole African search for their place in history. Acts to open up a new to get some corrections of the misconceptions and how the misconceptions keep coming up in spite of all that we do. Because to a great extent, how we look at ourselves determine what we do about ourselves. And we still look at ourselves in the main through the eyes of our oppressor. The best possible example is that silly, stupid movie, Shaka Zulu. 99% factually in error. But in order to straighten it out, you would have to read books written on Zulu life by the Zulus themselves. Mazzoli Kamini's excellent work, Emperor Chaka the Great. And another work written by uh, a South African writer, Thomas Moffalo, Chaka and Historical Romance. But there are many books, maybe the best book written on the results of the Zulu Wars is a book by J. Omar Cooper one of the few white writers who written something pretty decent on him, called the Zulu Aftermath. Then, inasmuch as there are so many African students in the country who are of Zulu extraction, why not talk to one of them? There's so many Africans in the country who, who are Zulus who are teaching in our schools. Why not just sit down and ask them? 
what did happen? There were Africans on both sides of that struggle. And what we have to take into consideration is that the greatest achievement of the European was the conquest of the mind, the conquest of the mentality, and that there wasn't enough European soldiers in all the world to control places as big as India, Africa, and the South Pacific. So they had to make you believe that you deserve to be ruled over by other people because you could not do it for yourself. Now, once military colonialism was partly over, another form of media colonialism came into power, the television, that has done more harm than good. The television literally made the, civil, the, made the civil rights movement, accentuated it, then slowly destroyed it and demeaned it. Now in the whole poll for president, when they mentioned the line of people that you're voting for who are eligible, why they never identify the others, they identify all of them by name until they get to Jesse Jackson, then they emphasized that he was a civil rights activist, which is a cold word. Black radical, don't vote for him. Part of the media conquest of the mind. Part of the media conquest of the mind is also unreal fantasies like different strokes and Webster. Now, you know in real life, nothing like that, nothing like that happens. They're not that good. <laughs> and because we have lost a feeling for what the mind can achieve, We missed our place in history because the, it was through the conquest of the mind that they convinced us that we were a minority. A minority convinced us that we were a minority. And we are one of the most dispersed people on the face of the earth. There are very few places on this earth where you won't find one of us. then there's very few of us that don't long for one of us. It's a feeling when you're isolated with the other people for a long time. The feeling just to look at the face of one of your own becomes so overwhelming. Langston Hughes describes this need for cultural kinship. In his book, I Wonder As I Wonder, he was going to China. He was on a boat with Europeans for about three months. He haven't seen a brother no place. He didn't even, couldn't even see the cook. <laughs> so he got to China, still didn't see one. And now, uh, Finally, he's going to his hotel. He got a rickshaw and passed the rickshaw with a brother. And he said, hi. The brother said, hi. <laughs> he never saw the brother again. <laughs> but like just said, he felt good the rest of his trip. <laughs> good for the soul. And what we don't understand is that through the conquest of the mind and through the media, we've been told to avoid each other. Well, that's the only special kind of soul medicine we can have is the meeting and the friendship one to the other. 
And if we ever united this and said that I won't buy a shirt except I buy it from you, I won't buy any shoes until I buy it from one of your shops, we could revolutionize our economy overnight. All this means is the restoration of confidence. Confidence in ourselves. And the seller of the shirt also had to have some responsibility to make sure that if he's selling to a brother or sister, he will sell a comparable, a good piece of good so that the brother and the sister could come back and recommend other brothers and sisters to come back and keep him in business. The business is a form of catering. So there's some certain things we have to learn again about ourselves. Now if one of us opened a store in China, I doubt if we'd get one customer. Open a store in India, I doubt if you could get one customer. In Korea, I doubt if you could get one customer. Same thing in Arabia. Then why are Koreans, Chinese, Vietnamese, and East Indians running stores in your community and making profit? And why not you? And the main thing is the lack of self-confidence. Confidence in yourself. There's no miracle about putting a store together. There's no miracle about buying. There's no miracle about bargaining. And that the man that's doing it is less intelligence than you, in many cases, less training than you, in many cases. So if he's doing it, chances are you can do it better. All right, let's go to tonight's subject because <laughs> What we're talking about is the rise and decline of singular one of the greatest movements in this century, maybe one of the greatest movements in any century for a people. We want to look at not only the civil rights movement, but what happened to it and what happened to the movement in the Caribbean, and what happened to the movement in Africa into the 80s when the coups and the counter coups began to overthrow governments after governments. Now, a brilliant young African was killed a few weeks ago, Thomas Sakara. Now, he was president of Burkina Faso, formerly called Upper Volta. Now, he had gone to a meeting previously with African heads of state. And at that meeting, he made a speech. He said, all of you are wearing shirts from France, shoes from England. I'm the only one here African enough to wear a pair of shoes made by my people with leather tanned and processed by my people in our own country. Then he showed his shoes just as good and just as shine, just as good as and just as good looking as the other shoes. So why don't you Africans at least learn to make the clothes you wear? In less than a month, he was dead. Because no one intends to let African people program themselves, support themselves, clothe themselves, feed themselves, school themselves, no place on the face of this earth. We are a colonized people, and because we do not understand that we are a colonized people and our enemy 
is presiding over us, principally our mind, and that we came out of the nature of oppression, our survival being one of the greatest miracles in the history of the world. But that oppression has left a lot of us brain damaged. And we won't admit that some of us are utterly sick lacking confidence in ourselves. I've seen it happen 10 times more over just to myself. I've seen a black person come up to me on the ask for direction or information. I give them correct information. They go right across the street and ask the white person. Same question. Then they go, then they move. <laughs> they lack confidence and in information coming from another people, from another person of their own. It is a tragedy for people to be out of power so long. All right, now let's go back and <coughs> look at <coughs> that period <coughs> when the civil rights movement began to lose its sting when those who intended to control it began to get their acts together and to systematically buy it all or destroy it. The high ceremonial point was the march on Washington a picnic on the grass, a publicity media miracle that achieved absolutely nothing. And because of the ceremony, all of the headlines, you got the illusion that we were moving forward when we were conceding something. Now, when Kennedy could not control the march, he integrated it. Now, all of this is in Malcolm X's message to the grassroots. One of the fine revolutionary messages of our time still unheeded and unheard by most black Americans. Because he emphasized that a revolution is about land. A revolution is about self-sustaining. A revolution is about dynamic social change. Unless you are about dynamic social change, you are not about a revolution. There's nothing basically wrong with reform. But reform is not revolution. We got confused trying to figure out what was reform and what was revolution. Now, we kept asking for change, but all some people wanted is entry in their master's house, acceptance in their master's house. And this is what we have to deal with. Because if you deal with the march on Washington in the integration of that march by trade unionists, Catholic clergy, you have to deal with the control of the content of the message that came out of the march. And the message that came out of the march was not revolutionary, did not call for revolutionary change. Now, we'll come to King's speech later. But there were certain things leading up to this. President Kennedy literally had the march integrated 
so he could control it. He put aside almost a million dollars presided over by a man named Curry. He was going to give a pro rata share to the six major civil rights organizations with the agreement that none of them would take any massive action without consulting the others. And by tying their hands together for a pittance, they stopped being creative because neither one understood what the other wanted to do or would approve of. Each one being creative in its own way. They gave away their creative urge to do something new and dynamic by agreeing on a collective and they were not the kind of organization that functioned as a collective. Different temperaments, different leadership, different missions, different programs. So Kennedy had taken the sting out of the movement. And besides, he had said before the march, he had given as much as he could Politically, he had yielded enough to blacks and didn't intend to yield any more. Now, Johnson, who gave more, and Truman, who gave more substantial change that's usable, both Southerners, both used the word nigger liberally, and yet both of them open new doors for new progressive elements to move forward over and above Kennedy. A northern rich brat who got annoyed by the pressure being put on him by the movement. All right, they gathered in Washington. John Lewis had written a dynamic speech really dealing with the issues in the United States forthrightly. Not so radically it would be unbearable, but dealing with it totally honestly, no syrupy. He did not have a dream. John Lewis had a plan. Now, in the classroom, I tell some of my students soon after this King's speech, everywhere King uses the word dream, use the word plan. I have a plan Then end with a threat. If my plan don't work, thus and so will happen. <laughs> This is where Martin Luther King missed Mahatma Gandhi's point. Mahatma Gandhi, a ruthless politician, would go to the British and say that these are my plans. And if the, these plans don't work, there are 70 million people in the northwest frontier called Sikhs. And they held knives so well you think they were born surgeons. <laughs> and the Sikhs were waiting up there and told the British, if, you, if, if his nonviolence don't work, our violence will. So having a violent alternative waiting in the wing, Mahatma Gandhi goes in to negotiate with the British with a power base. Martin Luther King had a violent alternative waiting in the wing, but he wouldn't use it. Big bad Malcolm in the nation of Islam. <laughs> they were straight then, they were ready to deal, and they had the weapons. If someone come to take a life, bring a life with you, 
because we tend to take some too. They were clear on that point. All right, now, a Catholic priest said that if John Lewis made his speech, he would withdraw. Now, the, the white trade union movement with the march, all of this is before, before the march, before the king made the speech, said if he made such a dynamic speech, pointing out errors in white approach, approaches to, to the movement, they would withdraw. In other words, the whites came into the march to have their way. They came into the march to control it. And they decided they would either control it or destroy it. You have to end your illusions about friends. And once you end your illusion and realize that if you want a friend, look in the mirror. That's where you start. See what's looking back at you. And if you have no friend there, chances are you may not have one at all. <laughs> that's, the only, that's the first one you need to depend on. All right. John Lewis altered the speech on the urging of A. Philip Randolph and Bad Rustin and other people around him. They left Martin Luther King out of the discussion. Roy Wilkins was also there. Now, when John Lewis altered that speech not to offend the whites, knowing full well that all he was speaking was the truth, and if the truth offends you, so what? That was the beginning of the white dismantling of the civil rights movement. Now, Dr. King makes the speech. As auditory, as speech making, it was one of the classic speeches of the 20th century. But you need to compare Martin Luther King's speech with Booker T. Washington's Atlanta Cotton Expedition speech. Because Booker T. Washington, a skilled craftsman and a con man, was telling the whites, these are your advantages. and the blacks too, and the northerners, and the southerners. These are the positive things you have that you can take advantage to, and that if you fail to take advantage of these things and pull yourself together and accommodate each other, that would be disaster. So as mild as people think Booker T. Washington was, as compromising as you think he was, he wasn't above threatening. If you don't do this, certain consequences are going to happen, and I'm not going to be responsible for them. Gandhi did the same thing. Now, I don't have time, and I'm not speaking, to, trying to, to prove specifically the king was not a follower of Mahatma Gandhi. I've done that in too many other places. <laughs> but I'm saying the king did not even know Mahatma Gandhi. Now, I admire both men in their political setting. But I know that very little relationship one to the other. Now, what, ki what kings was saying, he had a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, he'll see a black kid and a white kid side by side. In other words, I, I hope one day that you will accept us. We have to stop crying for other people's acceptance. And once we accept ourselves and build ourselves and strengthen ourselves, the question is not whether 
they will accept us, but whether we will accept them and on what terms. And this is a point we continue to miss. We can build ourselves to the point where we can say, we'll consider accepting you if you agree to these terms. Otherwise, we can do without you. You got nothing that I can't handle it do without. I can make my shoes, I can make my bread, I can fix my house. So what I need with you. Once we declare our own declaration of independence, we can deal with this. All right, now, King continued his harangue about the speech. The speech was one of the best integrationalist speeches ever made. It was a plea for acceptance. It was not a revolutionary statement saying that we want nationness. We want something in the world when we will not be beggars of other people, but other people might petition us. That means nation status, manhood status, and respectability in relationship to the control of nations. This is why a Jamaican without a high school education and no college education could build the largest mass organization before our sins because his focal point was the restoration of nations teaching us to think again on national terms, on universal terms in relationship to the African people of the world and not to those in one little corner called the United States. This is why they train our mind not to totally accept him then and now. This is why only Less than 10 days ago, in the conference in Jamaica, when all the intellects were saying, hail Marcus Garvin, and writing essays, and oh, what a great man he was, and come on, let's, let's stop all of this nonsense. You rejected Marcus Garvey when he first tried to found his organization in Jamaica, and you rejected him when he came back after being deported to the United States. There's a political atmosphere in Jamaica right now where a Marcus Garvey alive would be stoned to death. Wouldn't be safe. And when your revolutionary men, men who call for revolutionary change, cannot walk among you in safety, you have no freedom. One of the things when you look at England, a bunch of thugs, but when you look at England and find out what is the staying power of this nation that could commit so much wrong and get away with it, part of the staying power was a kind of liberalism, is that when something, an issue, comes up, all sides can discuss whether it is right or whether it is wrong. And those who lose the debate can go home and sleep without being killed in their bed. You got to give them that. Right now in the Caribbean islands, if you debate an issue and if you're on the losing side, the chances are you are in danger. Walter Rodney was driven, literally barred from Jamaica. Went home to his own country, Guyana. All he asked for was a job as a teacher, and he was a great teacher. 
I just want to settle down. I'm tired of running around now. Taught in Africa, taught all England. I just want to come home now and teach in my own country. I don't want to fight nobody. I mean, just, just, I'm a college teacher, just want a job. Got two children and a wife. I just want to live in peace. He was killed in his own town, in his own country. And that most of the dynamic radicals either must compromise to the local government or leave the country. Oh, now back to that later, but let's, get, let's see, let's look at this aftermath on the march on Washington. Because soon after the march on Washington, certain nat national things going to be set in motion. Less than a year, Kennedy is dead. And his death remains a mystery. You think this country is ruled by presidents. You have illusion. David Rockefeller has more power than 10 presidents. He can pick up a telephone and affect more change than any 10 presidents. The money master of the 20th century. You don't have to own a lot of money to be a money master, although it helps. You have to control it and know how to control the men with it because many people with it don't know what to do about it or with it. All right, now, digress for a minute. What went wrong in the Nixon administration is that Nixon turned to the new millionaire class. The new millionaire class had no power, what I call telephone power. They can pick up a telephone and change the nation around. They didn't have that kind of power. They hadn't been out there long enough. Even a Texas thug like Hunt was out of it. <coughs> he just got his power, got his millions day before yesterday. But those crusty old New Englanders who still got money left over from the slave trade, they have some real power. The new millionaire has a publicity man to get his pitch in the paper and to make him look good. The old millionaires hire a man to keep that picture out of the paper. They don't want anybody to see them. You might pass their house and see them washing their cars or mowing their lawns. And they and God got most of the money. But they've got power behind, behind that money. Now had Nixon known how to turn to the right people he might have been able to stay in power because the country was on its way to fascism anyway, still is. Authoritarianism is what threatened this country, not communism, because they're so weak and confused, they're the greatest threat to themselves. All right, now, you, what's this got to do with the issue? There's a lot to do with the issue, because many times people get your mind hung up discussing something that is totally irrelevant. The relevant things is who owns power and who can use that power. All right, the death of Nixon, the death of Kennedy, not only signal the decline of a possible liberalism that might give us a semblance of upward mobility, but it signaled not only the downgrading was a threat to whites but a threat to blacks at the same time. Now, it remained a mystery. Now, I don't believe 
that Oswald, the man they accused of killing him, had the brains to plan anything as big as this that required that kind of skill. I think he was a patsy, but that be that as it may. You can debate that the rest of you. you know, that's if you want to. <laughs> he was a patsy. You had to have brain to plan the killing of a president and to know the rooting, to know the timing, to know that you got to use a special kind of a high powered rifle and to aim from that distance and to bring down your target the first shot. That takes some skill and it takes some planning. He didn't have that kind of skill. So somebody else psyched him into doing it. All right. Soon after, Martin Luther King is assassinated. Now let's look at the scene. But before the assassination, something else is happening. King is losing favor in the civil rights movement, especially the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. They're pulling away from this concept of violence, of nonviolence. The deacons for defense, some of the younger people no longer see any feasibility in this kind of violence. Gandhi's nonviolence and King's nonviolence cannot be seen in the same light because Gandhi had a violent alternative he was willing to use. King did not have a violent alternative at all. It was ideal and would have been ideal for an ideal world had it been appealing to liberal Christian people who actually wanted to practice the judo Christian ethic, it would have had a point, but he wasn't even appealing to people who believed in it, let alone practiced it and had no intention uh, to do so. Now, the bumming of the young people, the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, and when King said that if blood must flow, let it be our blood and not the blood of our white brothers. Now you can see the disfavor in the question that is being brought up. Now, near the end, the last two years of King's life, you need to look at. You need to look at these last two years because Martin Luther King in those last two years was becoming a revolutionary minister and a revolutionary force. And our oppressor does not intend for any revolutionary force to emerge among us, least of all in the personality of a minister. Because a minister can say things over and above that of others and get away with it. All right, his association not only with the garbage strike in Memphis, but his speech on Vietnam and his calling attention to the waste of funds, his calling attention to the moral deterioration of this nation. Martin Luther King was to be gradually being transferred from one status into another kind of status. He was still a Christian. Make no mistakes about it. Martin Luther King was a Christian and a good Christian. But I'm saying that he was a poor realist, but a good Christian. But he was asking for a humane approach to the war in Vietnam. And he could see the utter stupidity of the war itself. 
when he began to advocate a people's, a poor people's march on Washington, including poor blacks and poor whites and poor everything. He was then on a collision course with power. He had a challenge the establishment. And if he continued on that course, he would have been a political power in this country. And no one intends for political power to emerge with understanding among African people. I said before, we are a nation within a nation searching for a nationality. And if we function as a nation, we could deny the Senate seat or the Congressional seat to any Southerner in the South and many of them in the North. We can just tell them, you're not going to Congress <laughs> next time. We have decided that you won't go. And we can make it stay. Now, before they let us exercise that kind of power, they will take the vote away from us. And they will rationalize it in the eyes of the world. All right, now, Martin Luther King is in Birmingham. He's in a black hotel. The black hotel is painted white. A white man in a white car kills a black man in a black neighborhood and gets away. What does this tell you about Martin Luther King's security? And what does this tell you about the possibility your mind. Why did this man get away clean? When do we protect people who go out of their way to protect us? King was moving away from this concept of solid nonviolence and asking for revolutionary change that, uh, that challenged the establishment. And every time a black person in this country shows his people the true face of power and what to do about it, he's either assassinated, driven into exile, or driven to suicide. And had we learned this, we'd have had a guard around him 24 hours a day. In the first place, no white person would have gotten close enough to him to shoot him. And if a white person registered in a hotel in a black neighborhood, we'd have been suspicious of him, let him register, but have some brothers who know how to handle guns. And so when he raised, before he could raise it up, he would be dead. Now you can see the dismantling of our revolutionary leaders and potentials of revolutionary leaders in the dismantling of the movement. We spent so much time celebrating the movement, we did not spend enough time protecting the movement, and our scholars did not put enough time in building a political floor for the movement. So when it changed, those young people would know the political meaning <coughs> of that movement. And they didn't. All right, now, <coughs> there's beginning to be rumbling in the movement. Call for some form of black consciousness that ultimately would lead to a call for black power. No one should call for black power unless someone had made up a decision their mind as to what you're going to do with it when you get it. Beyond the slogan, what is going to be. We became a sloganizing people 
the substituted slogans for action. We shouted, black and beautiful, black and beautiful. That don't frighten the white people. They know you're beautiful. They'll make some cosmetics to make you more so and put the money in the profit in their pocket. The world is not ruled by beauty or blackness. The world is ruled by power. So they control education and they control the mind. This is why the fight over textbooks is so fierce. You can't get a decent textbook in New York City. You can't get a decent textbook in New York State. Then why did Kenneth Clark sit quietly by and let them rule the Africans and the Asians out of the history of the world and a new global history of the world? And you got a black man sitting on the regions who didn't lift his voice. So what is the use of having black people in strategic power and strategic positions who don't handle that position correctly where we are concerned? There's no point of having them there. All right, now, with King gone, Kennedy gone, not that he was doing that much for us, <laughs> Malcolm X, the greatest significance can be attached to the assassination of Malcolm X because he was a true revolutionary leader. All of this is dismantling the civil rights movement, being dismantled because we did not understand the movement in the first place, do not understand. You can build a house, but it has to have a foundation. The foundation is the political meaning of its existence. And this is what Malcolm X called for in his famous message to the grassroots. Revolution is about land. It's about nation. We were asking for an integrated ice cream corn, an integrated toilet, an integrated hamburger, but we did not call for nation status. All of the African people in the United States put together are more than five states in the, in, in the Caribbean. Not in the Caribbean, in the Scandinavian. So you're more than a nation, you're more than five nations. All of the Jewish people in the world, and you can get this from the United Nations yearbook and from their yearbook, all of the Jewish people on the face of the earth are less than one half of the black population in the United States. Israel gets 10 times more aid than all the African nations in the world put together. They got that political thing together. We don't have ours together. They understand the one thing that we still grapple with, the concept of nation formation and nation management and nation significance. In essence, that's about all the Garvey message was about. And that's why he had to be literally chased out of Jamaica. And if he were alive today, he'd still be chased out of Jamaica. Now, people have tried to resolve the problem of Marcus Garvey by saying eight American intellects signed a petition for him to leave the United States. That's true. Asking for his deportation, that's true. Are you willing to deal with the fact that as high as 
of the officers or the people, the personnel administrating, administering the Garvey program on the FBI payroll, and none of them were, were black Americans? You ready to deal with that? Are well, you saying that he brought black Americans a program? He came here and found us with a wishbone and gave us a backbone, which is a lie. But are you ready to deal with the Caribbean betrayal of Marcus Garvey? No, you're not ready to deal with it. Because people have propagandized your mind into assuming that he failed solely because eight black American intellects signed a letter to the president asking for his deportation. None of them had any power. And the president didn't even answer the letter. <laughs> we are people who hesitate to deal uh, with truth. But as King, with King gone, Malcolm gone, Most of the gains were being taken away. Johnson no longer in the White House, a stubborn old Southerner who got some good things done, although he never could learn how to stop calling you. He couldn't even say nigger, he said nigra, you know. <laughs> but he got some good things done. And so did Truman. I have no love affair with either one of them, but I do have a love affair with truth. This is truth. The legislation that came through Truman and through Johnson did more for us than any two presidents ever to sit in the White House in this country. That don't mean that I like them too much as Southerners and still bigot, racist bigots, but enlightened enough to realize it was time for a change. Once the United States saw the civil rights workers, men like Bob Moses, others, James Foreman, going to Africa, coming back and praising Africa, they began to set up a cleavage, a propaganda cleavage between the black American and the African, the black American and the Caribbean American. That cleavage still exists. It is useless. It is uncalled for. And it is absolutely stupid. Makes no sense at all. All of us are reacting to different slave masters. And when we try to prove that one is different from the other, better than the other, all we are saying is that my slave master was better than your slave master. But if you're against all slave masters, you don't get into stupid conversations like this. <laughs> and sometimes we get into the point so that those people have no culture. Neither one of us have an African culture. Both of us have the manners of our slave master. Now, we were talking about an African culture, maybe we'd have, a, have something to discuss. If we were talking about the difference in African culture, we're talking about the difference in the manners of our master. That's all we're talking about. We say, we don't do things like this because this is not part of our culture. What, what culture are you talking about? <laughs> you talking about your African culture or your British inherited culture? Now, the United States had effectively diffused the most political African group in the world the most political African group in the world, not because they've got any super brain, the most political because they had to do certain things in order to survive 
that other African people did not have to do. The black American built more institutions, independent institutions, including a great church institution, the largest property owning group, being the church in its adjacent organization, not because we are that astute, but because we either had to build it, build our own schools, or have no schools at all. Now in the West Indies, you went to a school that was partly built by the British because they controlled the school. A curricula designed solely by the British because they controlled the school and controlled the mind along with it. Now our mind was being controlled also by the same in the same method, but we exercised some independence because we did have a few schools that we built with our resources and were maintained partly with our resources. Because we either had to get schools that way or have no schools at all. And while in the British area they made a point to make schools that the schools existed, but they controlled the schools and subsequently controlled the mind. Our mind was controlled too, still is, as yours still are controlled. <laughs> In a different way. Foundation education in England is basically better than foundation education in the United States. So the foundation education in the West Indies was better than that over here. That don't mean you came from a higher culture. You just came from a different slave master with a different system. And now that we've got statistics on this, nobody reads statistics except old oh, fuddy-duddy ex college presidents uh, or college teachers and most people don't even look at it and it takes years to get all this proof together it don't mean much to most people because the assumption was that the Caribbean child made better in the school system than the black American child but they're, de they're dealing with a restricted area in most of parts of the United States, there are no Caribbean children at all. And there's still black American children excelling in school. And so when you make a comparison based on the numbers, uh, that don't hold water. So the foundation education in England is reflected in the Eastern Seaboard, Detroit, Chicago and some other, but generally it's not reflected in the population in the United States straight throughout. And the comparison between the two people and the educational stimulant, both of them are stimulated by the general society and their and their masters and what they have to what they have to endure. All right, now <laughs> the decline of this movement forced a different kind of reality on us and forced us to realize that to some extent integration was misinterpreted and had set us back and that other ethnic groups benefited more from affirmative action than we did and still do. And that many times in the appeasement of the white woman, they take a job from a black man and they get away with it. We fell into a trap because we misunderstood the nature of our mission, if indeed we had a mission other than integration. 
integration itself was not a worthy mission. Had we asked for justice, integration would have been in that package to take or leave, depending on how we saw the situation. All right, now, let's go to what happened in the Caribbean islands after the decline of the concept of federation. Because some Caribbean people think my extra arrogance qualifies me to be a Caribbean person. Sometime I pass for a West Indian. <laughs> so when the debates were in London, I went with Felix Cummings from Guyana, who was then Chetty Jagan's man. And I got into the same debates as the rest of the Caribbean people. I knew every island, read every book of consequence on the respective countries. And I was a good West Indian defender. We, after the whole thing went down and the big personalities fighting among themselves made a fool out of themselves and we knew that they'd blown the Federation. And uh, we all went out and had a drink and see what we can do and see if we could chase somebody. I mean, we just thought we needed an outlet, you know, you know somewhere. But we, we pretty much knew that it fell on the basis of a personality. Then people need a haven in the world, a political haven, a cultural haven, an economic haven in the world. So from then on, with the Federation gone, they began to tie that destiny with the former country, England. England is in so much trouble itself that that wasn't much of a success in a lot of cases. And besides, America was taking over the money market and taking over a lot of British market. America had replaced England as a major imperialist country while giving lip service to anti-imperialism. Biggest liars in the world in that regard. Now, while psychologically they were still depending on England, but they were bidding for American tourists, American trades, and American goods. But another imperialism was not only setting in in the Caribbean, but it was imperialism that was setting in throughout the world. The imperialism of American music, and American soft drinks. Coca-Cola imperialism, Pepsi-Cola imperialism, and the imperialism of American popular music, mostly black themes. And so America began to get a cheap reputation as a culture figure for projecting some things that had nothing to do with culture at all. And the only thing that can be called a culture was really the music. And even that was souped up or watered down to the point where the creators of the music didn't seem to know it anymore. But it was becoming popular on the market and images were being used to capture the Caribbean mind. The Caribbean mind is just as much a captive mind as the mind in the United States. The greatest achievement of the European was the conquest of the mind. And once we liberate that mind from dependency, we will liberate the people because we will once more convince them that they can control nation. Now, when you go to Africa, you have to understand that 
certain things we were supposed to do in regard to ideology we failed to do or failed to understand that we needed to do. When on the night of March the 7th, 1957, when Nkrumah said, at last the long night is over. Ghana, our beloved country, is free forever. The country called the Gold Coast is now called Ghana. The idea came from Nkrumah's schoolmaster, Joseph B. Dunqua. Once that happened, a lot of ideas we had needed to be reassessed. And one of the ideas most need a reassessment was the idea of Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism developed in the West in a formal sense was a motherless African child. Once Ghana was independent, the motherless African child had found a mother and a home. All of us now needed to sit down away from Africa, crying for a mother. How do we behave psychologically from this point on? We are no longer a landless people. We are no longer people creating ideologies that have no home. And Krumah, a pan-African president, is head of a country. He's walked among us. He visited the Harlem Y. He went to a black school. He understands to some degree the nature of our oppression. We hail him and parade him as a great hero, but we did not understand the need of all African people throughout the world to come together and make a principal statement behind that man in the beginning of nationness, because we lonely people away from Africa needed a home someplace, whether we went to it or not. We needed a home in the world. Our souls were lonely. Our dreams had no foundation because they had no home. And the concept of African world unity developed by black intellects outside of Africa, the concept now had a home. The motherless child had a mother and a home. And a supporter in a president of an African country who understood the nature of pan-Africanism, having lived <laughs> in the United States, having read Marcus Garvey, having attended some of the meetings, having walked down Lenox Avenue, listened to the soapbox speakers, argued with some, agreed with some, disagreed with some. Now he would have start a black star line, and he would say that Garvey's ships never got to Africa, but our ships will get to America. We did not understand the significance of the event of Ghana. We had to also understand that the Western world did not intend for any African country and any African leader to be free of their domination. And they had already began the plan to pull him down through spies, through betrayal, through the army, through propaganda. And after the great start, after his speeches, after his action, and I'm glad I visited Ghana during the time, 58, because you could cut the confidence with a knife, it was so thick and so beautiful. 
You go into office after office, people are proud of themselves as Ghanaian and as African people and made you feel proud. Something had to happen on from our enemy's point of view to make us stop feeling pride, to kill that pride. Africans were coming into power almost by the week. Each week, there was a different African independent country until nearly all of Africa was independent. When Nkrumah, Ben Bella, had a meeting in Tanzania and they were talking about an African bank of reconstruction and Ben Bella said that all of this is good, but what you need is a blood bank. If we're going to free South Africa, all of us are going to have to put an expeditionary army together and march on South Africa. My country pledges 20,000 soldiers. What will the rest of you do? And when African countries coming together under the OAU began to pledge soldiers to march, an expeditionary force to march on South Africa, everyone that made the pledge was out of power within the year. Ben Bella was in jail. Krumah was dead. Krumah was deposed. Had he stayed at home, he could have rallied the government, rallied the people, and saved his government. He extended himself too far, too fast, trying to solve international problems before he could solve domestic problems. But yet he was the noble dreamer that took Africa for her walk in the sun. He moved maybe too fast, too far, without successful planning. In the disruption active action in the Congo, the Ghanaian army was headed by an English general, Alexander, who prevented the African soldiers of Ghana, the Ghanaian soldiers, from saving the life of Patrice Lumumba. This is show you something about the folly of giving authority to someone to handle your armies other than an African person, other than a member of your own respective group. Now what I've been talking about is the decline of a massive evidence, a massive effort for Africans to be free throughout the whole world. And why and how this, eff this, this effort failed. And it failed because we did not think like nations or act like nations. For our next mission in the world was to assume the responsibility of nations, nation formations, nation concept, nation management, because no people can exist as the protracted guest in another people's house, though they were brought to the house against their will. I'm not saying leave the United States. You made the United States. We built its railroads. Our labor laid the basis for its capital and its industrial might and its scientific achievement. That no matter where you live on the face of this earth, all of us, no matter what island you came from, you are distinctly an African people. And when we think as an African people, and support African sovereignty, we will be sovereign everywhere. We have to build 
some place in this world for our children and their children. And we have to start this by reclaiming our own communities. Maybe the mistakes of the civil rights movement, the Caribbean Federation movement, the African freedom explosion, are lessons to us. Lessons that are very expensive. I hope we have learned this lesson because we cannot continue to repeat the same mistakes generation after generation. And gone their separate way, they are no longer a part of us except they look like us, they wear our complexion. But they have no commitment to us. And I think that they're going to be driven to reality. And I just don't think there's a capitalist solution to our program for our problem. I don't think there's a communist solution either, except for that one which we control. I don't think that we are people without hope. I don't think we're people totally without plans. But we are people who are great dreamers. And I think we have to face reality more realistically than we've ever faced it before. And also face the fact that uh, we have few, uh, if any at all, friends in the world. And we have to begin by being first friends to ourselves. I think this consciousness of what we have to do for ourselves, by ourselves, is growing. And if I didn't think that and work toward it, I don't think uh, I would have a strong reason for getting up in the morning and continuing to live. Uh, good evening, Dr. Clark. Yeah. I really uh, enjoyed your lecture. I'd like to ask, speaking of Ghana, what do you think currently of Flight Lieutenant Jerry Wallens? I think he's a young man that should never have been head of a state. I don't think he knows what a state is. If he did know what a state was, I think he might do something about it. I don't believe that the military can ever rule a state because the military man by design is not a statesman or a state craftsman. Um, I've been in the country twice since he's been in power and I'll be back there again in April, God willing. Or, um, but I think Ghana has gone progressively back with each coup and each change. Ghana has uh, lost. And I think someone needs to put Ghana back on the road again. And I just don't think the lieutenant is, has the mental capacity to do it. Dr. Clark, if we can't get rid of the enemy names, how can we get rid of the enemy himself? I don't believe that the changing of the name, although symbolically good, is absolutely essential to freedom. I think it's a good thing to happen and I think systematically it's going to happen. Now, <clears throat> both of my children uh, have African names. And I imagine their children will have African names. But because my name is, is a professional name that I'm known by throughout the world, I didn't feel called on to, to change it. I really don't think the name changing is, a, is the greatest issue. The greatest issue is the changing of the mind. Can you just briefly talk, talk about uh, Nkrumah in this book uh, um, by, I think her name was Magdalene Bryan, Garvey, Lumumba, and Malcolm, black national separatists. She heavily criticized Nkrumah about the you know, the fact that he sent some white soldiers and a white general and th to overthrow uh, Patrice Lumumba. I mean, to help Patrice Lumumba and they turned It was just, just a white general. It was African, it was Ghanaian soldiers. Ghanaian soldiers. Could well, you kind of talk about that a little bit, what happened? Nkrumah was, 
getting an army together fast, and he had hired a British uh, general who had formerly been a general uh, in the colonial army. I think it was a mistake, but it's nothing unusual because the same thing happened in Spain after the Africans and the Arabs lost Spain. Spain, the Spanish had no generals. So many of the Africans and the Arabs stayed on in independent Spain in general and stayed on in other capacities in Spain. So there's nothing historically unusual about it. And if you understand this, you might understand the character of Othello, a misunderstood character in, in history. Because most people do, don't believe that a black man would be in charge of a white army in Europe at that time. But it was nothing unusual for black men to be head of white armies. <coughs> and, uh, but he had one reason, but Alexander had another reason. Alexander was still a colonial Englishman wanting colonialism to stay in Africa. And had he not been in charge, Lumumba could have been saved. I think it was, it was a mistake to have him at that juncture in history. Dr. Clark, I want to thank you, thank you. Uh, last week for giving us something to ponder. And that was, you said you would like to, you asked us a question, why is it that Marcus Garvey will not let us bury him? I want to thank you for giving us to ponder over. Thank you very much. Parting this week. Now, the question I have at this time is, I <clears throat> had a Jewish lawyer to ask me, why is it that so many blacks keep wanting to be Muslim or go the Arab way when the Arabs were the worst of the slave masters during the uh, time that we were taken from African <laughs> slaves? Well, a lot of Jewish people, lawyers and all, have asked me the same question. But we are in a revolt against the slave master's religions. And because we do not have any detailed knowledge on the Arab slave trade, many blacks who don't want to be Christians assume that the Arabs were not also slave slave traders. But remember, the Jews were slave traders.